In September 1962, the third of three Air Force F-104A starfighters was delivered to Burbank to be modified into the NF-104A, world's first aerospace flight trainer. Just as the T-33 T-Bird provided operational transition from propeller-driven aircraft to jet power, the NF-104 mission is to provide operational transition from manned fighters to manned spacecraft. It will be the first aircraft in which the pilot can both take off and land in a conventional manner and still experience spaceflight. Changes in the external configuration have been incorporated into wind tunnel models for aerodynamic evaluation. An instrumented nose boom has been added. The plastic nose cone has been replaced by a metal one. The air inlet cone has been redesigned and the tail section has been modified to accommodate a throttle controlled rocket engine and the TF-104G vertical tail. Since early 1962, wind tunnel testing of the aerospace trainer design has been underway. It has been tested in the Point 9 to Mach 1 range at NASA's Ames Laboratory. Here at Lockheed's Research Center in Newhall, California, the model has been tested in the supersonic tunnel at speeds up to Mach 2.4. These tests have shown that the rocket pod fairing has no appreciable effect on directional or longitudinal stability. On August 17, 1962, Air Force pilots from the Aerospace Research Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base inspected the model and observed testing as a scheduled part of their training. These select experimental test pilots are being trained to both participate and instruct in space programs. They undergo an intensive academic course closely integrated with flying. This group of pilots will be the first to fly the aerospace trainer and then subsequently conduct training programs for future space crews using the NF-104A as the primary aircraft in the curriculum. While aerodynamic characteristics were being determined, detailed designs for the internal modifications were being completed. The existing power plant the J79-3A will be replaced by the Dash 3B. The selected rocket engine is the LR121-NA-1, which is throttle controlled and delivers 6,000 pounds of thrust. With strictly tactical equipment and systems removed, modification involves the installation of components peculiar to the aerospace trainer. Just forward of the inlet ducts, Two hydrogen peroxide tanks will supply the oxidizer for the rocket engine. They are connected in series and are pressurized by nitrogen. In the nose cone, a smaller tank will provide hydrogen peroxide for the reaction control system. It is pressurized by its own nitrogen bottle. A battery will provide auxiliary electric power and bottled nitrogen will maintain cockpit pressurization after jet engine flame out. Electrical and electronic equipment will include radio, IFF and radar beacon, as well as stability augmentation for both aerodynamic and reaction controls. Instrumentation includes an automatic observer, an oscillograph recorder, and additional specialized flight and engine instruments. The X-15 reaction control system has been modified and adapted for use in the aerospace trainer. It operates on hydrogen peroxide, pressurized by nitrogen. Eight reaction motors in the nose will provide pitch and yaw control. And two motors in each wingtip will provide roll control. The reaction system will be operated by a separate controller located on the instrument panel. The aerospace training flight is designed to provide specific pilot experiences. The rocket boost phase will provide experience in the operation of a throttle controlled rocket engine. During the ballistic portion of the flight, the pilot will shift to reaction controls. While in this area, he will operate for nearly a full minute under zero G conditions. The descent involves re-entry simulation with the final phase providing experience in normal landings. Starting from Edwards Air Force Base, the flight will begin with the initial climb out and the start of acceleration. After reaching Mach 2 and climbing to 40,000 feet, the pilot will then ignite the rocket engine and make a 3G pull-up. At 80,000 feet, the turbine will flame out. 
and the pilot will shift to reaction control and will experience the zero G low Q phase. At 116,000 feet, hydrogen peroxide depletion results in burnout of the rocket engine. Letdown and re-entry is planned so that in the final phase, with adequate fuel reserve, will be directly over Edwards Air Force Base, thus completing a realistic simulation of a space mission. By the end of September 1962, the three F-104s were undergoing teardown and modification. Periodic inspections and technical order compliances were being completed according to contract specifications. During modification, component mock-ups and tanks were being used while actual flight hardware was being fabricated and assembled. By October, the cockpit mock-up was near completion. The first Air Force phase inspection resulted in recommendations for a final cockpit arrangement. Modifications were made to the extent that engine instruments and rocket instruments were grouped on separate panels. The reaction controller was moved from the side of the cockpit to the instrument panel. Fabrication of the air inlet duct cones for the three aircraft was completed. Incidentally, these are the same type cones used on the F-104 that set the world's altitude record of 103,395 feet in 1959. During this report period, fabrication of the nose cone was begun. Templates were cut and layup was underway by the end of the month. The plaster of the rocket pod fairing was near completion, scheduled for the last week in October. The rocket engine uses JP-4 fuel from the main aircraft supply with hydrogen peroxide as the oxidizer. Since these propellants are hypergolic, no ignition system is required. It is capable of unlimited restart. It is regeneratively cooled by hydrogen peroxide, pumped through the jacket in the double wall thrust chamber before being injected for combustion. This rocket engine can be throttled from 50% to maximum thrust at any altitude. The F-104 aerospace trainer will fill a dire need of today's aerospace pilots for an adequate training tool. No new breakthroughs are involved. The entire concept is being developed with standard systems and off-the-shelf items. Consequently, the development program is a relatively inexpensive one, which will provide the much-needed operational transition from manned fighters to manned spacecraft.